we have grass fever. Hello and welcome to Pod People, the stickiest podcast this side of the Mississippi. I'm Oni Baba Yaga, Jonathan Wixon, Matisse Van Rossum. <laughs> I'm Ben Sheets, and I am a true shinobi. I'm Cleveland Mosier, and war, war never changes. Until it does. And you uh, know what happens when it does? Your ass is grass. <laughs> well, uh, grass is certainly the subject of the hour, isn't it? Because this week we're talking about an old movie, an old one. One of the oldest movies ever made. <laughs> not really. That is not true. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> uh, Less than five minutes in, and we're already spouting lies. It's good. Right. It's good. Uh, yeah, you can't know who to trust in this episode of The Pod People. That's the lesson. Trust no one. But I'll tell you, I'm definitely not the one you can trust, or am I? Uh, we're talking about Oni Baba, a film from 1964, directed by... Uh, Kaneto Shindo, starring Nobuka Otoa, Jitsuko Yoshimura, and Kei Sato. Uh, forgive my pronunciations. This is a Japanese movie, and it's about two women uh, who uh, live in a big field of grass, and they kill samurai and steal their gear to sell it for grains. And one of them starts banging their neighbor, and the other one is not too happy about it. Nope. Uh, this was my pick. You know, you. I'm usually the one that picks uh, the left field, <laughs> sillier options usually, but after the Giver, I felt you like we welcome. needed something more serious and atmospheric. I appreciated it. It was nice to come back to that. Yes. This movie is like the complete opposite of the Giver. God, yes. <laughs> it truly is. <laughs> yeah, the reason I picked this movie is... It's one of, in my opinion, the scariest, most atmospheric, intense horror movies that came out before, uh, like, 1965. The atmosphere in particular, it's so overwhelming at times with uh, all of the very tall grass, as we mentioned before. Lots of uh, grass. It's crazy how much atmosphere is just built through shots of grass blowing in the wind. But when it's completely surrounding you and there's nothing else and there's samurai and demons and other things lurking in the tall grass, it gets quite spooky. What gorgeous grass. As a setting, it's quite disorienting, which I think really helps the atmosphere and pace of the film a lot. This movie is slow as shit. But that's okay. Yeah, man. Like, what a burn. What a passive, just slow rolling film. And every just ounce of it is serves a purpose, though. Like, it 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 has like such like beautiful utility. Like, it, ah, what a what an incredible movie. So yeah. visceral. I don't think there's a single line of dialogue for like the first ten minutes of the movie. Like, basically the entire setup, you get just about everything you need from like pure visuals well it's uh, what visuals they are it starts so brutally too you start with two samurais fighting in the middle of the tall grass and all of a sudden they're both murdered before that even there's the, the hole. hole yeah true i will say i knew nothing I, I i don't think i'd even heard of this film before you mentioned it last week on the podcast it's kind of a deep cut yeah i feel like it it's uh very underrated and and under talked about it's when it a... comes to uh older older horror films yeah and um... i mean it has the benefit like i i definitely don't think that uh that this is a film that a lot of modern audiences would necessarily enjoy but it's... <laughs> at the same time i think there's fingerprints of this movie all over a lot of modern horror yeah totally. you know you see shades of the lighthouse shades of like in the tall grass <laughs> obviously for obvious <laughs> right reasons. well that was a much worse you know, movie. but i i think the lighthouse is a great comparison because it I really know is it's pe two people stranded in a a location of ambiguity mm -hmm. and terror it's all the better for it but yeah this movie it's widely respected in world cinema for horror, uh, it is Japanese, um, which is part of the reason I think not as many people have seen it. Yeah. Um, but it is, you know, like a big Criterion release. It is. 
Good. Yes, that's um, how that's how I first became aware of it through the Criterion Collection, and I, I think that it definitely earns its place uh, uh, in the collection. Yeah, it's, I'll say it's very good. Um, yeah, not not a not a a film for contemporary audiences. It's slow and boring as shit. It's black and white. What's the deal with that? And subtitles? Forget about it. But if you are into those things, right? God, I'd recommend it. Like, if you're not going to be upset that Captain America doesn't show up in this one. <laughs> <laughs> that might be for you. Yeah, like Tony Stark is not even in the post credit scene. I know. Or Nick Fury. Any of them. <laughs> nope. The only reason I, I brought that up before we got into the synopsis was just, once again, not knowing anything other than the title did me well seeing this film. And if that is your sort of thing, I would, you know, I'd go ahead and just lay that out there that it's it's worth it's worth watching, especially without like the the foreknowledge yeah, going yeah. into it. But anyway, we can get into uh, the rest now. I'll... Sure. Yeah, well, it's definitely a war movie. It's very much uh, in the same vein of samurai films, but it's much more brutal in that, you know, it follows two peasants in the midst of this crisis being surrounded by tall grass. They don't know what's around them. The war is all around them. But they don't know what's going to appear at any time. Right. They they kill for survival, you know, to sell the gear, to get food, whatever they can get to survive. And for, like, it being a, a war film, we see little to no traditional war. We never see, like, an army on the march or anything of that sort. You always, We're always just getting the, the periphery. Those, like, right, those the war small is the background. Skirmishes yeah. between two or three people, you know, that, like, make their way into their little area in the grass. You just get this, like, this sense of the, even the war being just, like, devoured by this, like, desert of, of tall grass, this ocean of grass. It has such a foreboding presence, just constantly like swallowing up you, the camera, the characters as well. Yeah, and I mean, also like there's definitely a sense of claustrophobia with like the grass, you know, surrounding you on all sides because you can't really see through it very well, you know. So like Ben said, they live kind of in in a constant state of alertness because they don't know who, you know, could be uh, stumbling across their hut at at any time. You know, it's 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 not about the war. The war is the backdrop. It's about like how the people who have nothing to do with the war are affected by it mm -hmm. and how they they sort of uh break down into into a uh, uh more base forms in order to uh to survive yeah they're reduced to like total primitives like yeah. they have they have no other choice you know it seems like even the the farmers are like hiding in the hills yeah with what little uh flax and um wheat they have mm -hmm. which is Ooh boy what well, a yeah. rough time to what a rough time to be alive <laughs> Our uh, our central protagonists are uh, are unnamed largely. Uh, there's an old woman and uh, her daughter-in-law. The husband slash son has uh, sort of been conscripted into this war against his will and has been gone for a long time. And uh, one of his his friends or their their nearest neighbor who got conscripted at the same time shows back up. And says, uh, oh, hey, your son was killed. Your husband was killed. Um, but I made it back, though. So that's cool. Right. And then the 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 daughter kind of uh, begins a, a romance with him that draws her apart from from the old woman, from the mother. Yes. And when the uh, the friend of the husband returns Hachi uh, Hachi that's right Hachi did his he's name. one he is one of the few named characters mm -hmm. yeah when when Hachi retur returns he also makes it clear that he uh like in his desperation to get back well I say in his desperation but he doesn't treat it with desperation he laughs about it when he when he, when yeah. he speaks of the fact that he murdered a priest on his way back home so that he could disguise himself on the road because less people were willing to accost a priest even though he murdered one um uh, so we we get an immediate vibe that he's much like them he's been reduced to a a uh, bad person <laughs> like yeah i had to i had to stop and like like choose the words yeah. properly but he's been reduced to a bad he's person bad. Yeah, like yeah. and like he's he's murdered a priest on the road well i mean and i think there's a fair amount of ambiguity about what actually happened to to the husband anyway because like hachi says like 
oh yeah, we were coming back. And then all of a sudden, 20 farmers came out of nowhere and beat him to death, and I barely got away. And it's like, that seems like a pretty suspect narrative, doesn't it? It does, but also like... They're farmers that have been murdering samurai. Exactly. So, so like, it's like it's it's believable, but it's also like, well, did he actually mm-hmm. kill the well, son? And also husband? that like the miscellaneous warriors that like this this mother and uh, daughter in law have been murdering could have been her son. You know, I'm not not literally, but figuratively, like they could have been there. You know, it's just, right. it's just they're in the same situations as well. These are just conscripted men, but just out of a necessity, uh, out of you know the need to to eat to survive, they're still killing these people. But there's no remorse in no. this movie. No characters ever really show anything, and there's commentary on that too. Like when the mother learns that her son has died, like she shows no sorrow. She doesn't like wail or cry or anything. She just she just takes it, and the daughter-in-law does show a little bit um but even then it's barely anything and it's just because they've already been like so desensitized they've already been so ruined they were likely already expecting to hear this news if they didn't just assume he was dead already as yeah. it is yeah yeah but i just i i, I thought that an interaction was fascinating like how the mother actually like kind of gives the girl a hard time yeah for like feeling something like learning that her husband just died and like the mother is just dead straight on like yeah. just trying to keep well i mean she is ultimately only concerned with her own survival even when her daughter-in-law starts her affair with hachi it doesn't make the mother angry because like that's her son's wife but that if she gets involved with hachi then she's gonna abandon the mother and how is she going to then kill samurai and be able to sell their equipment to get more food so it's like every every motivation in this movie is completely selfish yes nobody is like looking out for each other it's all it's all very very self-serving that's one of the things that i love about this movie is because like these are the only people that we're spending any time with and they're all pretty shitty people they have redeeming qualities like they're likable in certain ways but they are also like kind of bad people yeah well, we, we see each of them make a choice yeah like it's like an extreme survivalism that mm-hmm. turns them into narcissists you know in a lot of ways but you also wonder too like how much of it is also like the the circumstances like brought out what was already there there's an ambiguity to that which i which i appreciate regardless like they are like victims of of that time like there's totally. no doubt there. Yeah, absolutely. But we also see them, which I think is really important that the movie does this. We also do see them like commit acts that they well could have not committed. And there there are times where the war is not an excuse. Um, and then there are times where the war is utilized as an excuse as well. Um, so that, you know, like there's never a sense of like like blaming like people who you really can't afford to blame. I thought that was really well done. I, I wasn't expecting that. And it was it was very gratifying to always yeah. give like proper motivation for the characters. And especially with the mother, like you were saying, how she makes it clear she doesn't want to be left alone. We also see that she's equally horny and and jealous oh my god this like movie for, is for so reason. horny this is one of the horniest <laughs> movies i've ever seen and there's such a strong amount of like sexual tension yeah that, that grips this movie from the beginning i think like even the the jump scare sort of moments like the title of this movie is a jump scare and um even that is just like to give you this like sense of like being put on edge and like kind of ramping you up whether it's for murder or for for fucking like yeah. you're you're always like amped watching this film as slow as it is you're constantly waiting for that and it's next pretty thing to yeah happen. it's pretty quiet for most of the movie too so like when the action kicks in extremely suddenly like it's always so jarring and like the score is really kind of uh uh frantic and wild and and weird and just like a a fantastic combination it's bombastic of, yeah honestly well, the interesting thing to me is while all the characters are very horny through the movie, I wouldn't call this like a particularly sensual movie by any means. No, like, not a really. lot of the oh, yeah. no. sexual scenes are kind of unsettling because they're shot in such shadows. They're always sweaty. The like, movie is horny, but it didn't make me horny. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> well said. Well said from both of y'all. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's so interesting, too, because they're so isolated that anything that they can get, it's such repression. Right. You know, otherwise that they're they're looking for a, a 
sort of you know narcissistic release for that yeah and like during this like this like horrible depression they're not just repressed but they're also just starved yeah of it like they're starved of like really any social interaction to begin with let alone like sexual interaction and and you you just you compound that with like a, a complete like, and also lack of a community and any literal, anyone you can have sex with like and also being literally starving as well yes i i think this is a, a great chance for us to talk about the whole because you mentioned that earlier cleveland this uh this deep dark pit in the middle of the field that uh despite the obvious uh sexual connotations of like this kind of bottomless pit that they feed men to it's a hungry uh, hole yeah you know it's very representative of all of the characters and the circumstances that they're living in in general like there is a constant need to fill some kind of hole whether it's like your you know your desire for companionship or company or sex or the fact that you're hungry and like you have to literally fill your belly like it never ends like there their entire existence has been reduced completely to survival, to filling some kind of hole one way or another. But the hole cannot be filled. It cannot. Doesn't matter how many samurai you put in there. Nope. <laughs> and they throw a bunch of them in there. They do. They do. Can we really quickly go back to like the, the opening sequence? Sure. I, yeah. I just adore that scene for mm, a multitude of reasons. First, for several of the shots in the opening sequence, you can't determine what's going on initially. Like you have to just sort of slowly let the image build itself out of the grass. Like, out of, like, the abstract, like, shadowy, like, disparate shapes that are just constantly flowing and moving, like, slowly a figure will emerge out of them. Like, and it's something you can really only do in black and white. This, like, wonderful stark contrast. So we have these, like, the the two figures, like, running through this, like, this, like, ocean of grass, and they just, like, they keep, like, disappearing and then reappearing as they're running through. And I've I've never seen a film do, like, like, like tall grass action like this it's a, it's an old cliche at this point it's like the velociraptors you know and like the the jurassic park movies or whatever and there's there's plenty of examples of like oh the tall grass moves and then something like you know goes down in it oh, or yeah, whatever absolutely and and like it just all seems like so fruitless to me now like seeing like how well this movie did it right off the bat like just call it a day <laughs> like yeah like this film did it perfectly it uh, does a fantastic job of of establishing the setting yeah and you mentioned how great it works in black and white i i really think this is one of the high water marks in terms of black and white cinematography I, agree. I think it's one of those movies that wouldn't translate to color very well no no absolutely no, no not. point absolutely because no point. part of the starkness of it comes from that black and white cinematography yeah. and a lot of the tension comes from the black and white moody cinematography you, you want to talk about films that i i see little to no reason to remake this is this this would be one for me generally like i i recognize and like we've talked about this before and how like there's always room for remake with um i think the hitcher we talked about like there's there's room for it whatever else like this but for this film no. i really for once like do not see i don't think that's a anything remake we have to worry needed about or feasible no thank god though right so. like this, let, this film is perfect this is like not, this is the way it this is does like, not don't touch seem it. like the kind of movie that some like cynical studio would think <laughs> no, up and thank say god. No. let's make a modern modernization of this movie mm -hmm. fast-paced action <laughs> yeah exactly put fucking captain america in it <laughs> thanos is the one in the hole america baba <laughs> it's a bunch of white people playing asian samurais yep oh my god oh yeah yikes big yikes speaking of big yikeses uh the samurai get stabbed uh yeah in the grass and uh we just see blades appear and then they fall uh, and then there's this wonderful shot. It's one of my favorite shots in the movie of the the two dead samurai laying over the top of each other and the camera slowly I think it zooms like it like zooms in on the grass. It's a zoom or a them. dolly yeah. either one yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it tracks in or zooms in like over the top of them like into the grass and again like because the grass is like so riddled with like abstraction you can't tell like what you're seeing and like the figures slowly come up out of it and I I thought that like because of like the rate the camera was zooming at over the figures you lose a sense of scale yeah like in this same shot and then like the 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 mother and daughter-in-law like emerge out of the shadows but the way that they emerge like i thought they were like standing figures but it was actually just like their hair parting it really threw me watching in real time like 
these tangible shapes like come out of yeah. the abstraction one, was awesome. One of the like, things I movie. really love about that shot too is since it's overhead, because of the black and white, the the the, the blood stain on his shirt is so dark and deep that it almost reflects like the hole that yeah. we see yeah. right before. And that's that's such a brilliant like parallel that you it wouldn't work in color just because it's so deep and dark and yeah absolutely yeah there are there are several shots in the movie that that like go out of their way to simulate like that same like central hole like the doorway mm -hmm. to the the house very often like is portrayed as like this like sort of like this portcullis this like this through point um and you do feel like when it's tracking towards the door that like you're going up and out of this cavern you know even though you're standing on flat ground it yeah it's so disorienting a lovely movie yeah, and and after they kill them, you know, we see this long scene of them silently like stripping the corpses, you know, collecting their armor and their weapons and dragging their bodies to the hole to throw them in and then carrying all the shit back to the hut and then sort of like ravenously like eating rice out of a bowl with their bare hands and, you know, slurping water like dogs and then just collapsing and falling asleep. Sleep. Like and once again at the at this point there still hasn't been a single word said in the movie. You know, it's it's not even until the next day when they get up, pack up all the weapons, and take it to like the blacksmith guy who they sell the shit to. Like he's the first one to even speak, I think. Like you know everything you need to know about the setup to this movie before a single line of dialogue is said. I think that, that is such uh, an an exquisite example of showing instead of telling and just like visual storytelling without exposition something that is sadly lacking from a lot of films uh these days yeah and i think it sets the tone for the movie super well of you never know what's going to be in the grass and right. it's dangerous everyone's out for survival everybody's desperate mm-hmm uh, let's talk about the arrival of the masked samurai about yes. two thirds of the way into the movie, I guess. That is where I think that the horror elements really start kicking in more so. Traditional, like, like macabre horror. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, the, the film is horrifying, like, from the beginning, like, to yeah. be sure. But, like, when, yeah, when you're, when it comes to, like, there being, like, something spooky. Yes, absolutely. Well, point, and that's, that's where the, the, the real brunt of the traditional adaptation comes from. You know, yeah. this was, like, a traditional Japanese ghost story in a lot of ways right. when it comes to that part so this samurai comes and he is uh very well adorned and wearing this very spooky sort of mask with an horns. oni mask yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a traditional japanese demon mask mm -hmm. uh and he's he he shows up to their hut while the daughter is off uh fucking hachi like she does and only the the mother-in-law is is here at this point and when she's accosted by this uh, horrifying figure who says, you know, oh, I'm not going to hurt you. Just lead me out of the grass yeah. or I will hurt you <laughs> or I will hurt you. I love that because at first he doesn't feel the need to say it because the 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 implication is already well known. Yeah. What I like about him, too, in terms of like what he represents is like he's the closest human personification we have to the whole backdrop of the war he's like a samurai general he's you know wealthy he comes from a noble family and so he is like one of the people who would be largely responsible for this conflict that is like ravaging the country he's representative of that and that's why like he is faceless he just wears the face of a demon because it's not about him like a specific person it's like what he is like a culmination of 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 all of these ideas and and fears and i mean he's similarly uh uh narcissistic and selfish like the rest of the the characters too claims he wears the mask because his face is so beautiful that he couldn't stand the thought of of it being uh damaged in combat and you love like how the, the mother like immediately like gets like aroused by 
that too and it's just like hey well show me if you She's like, like oh that, yeah that'll be my reward right like if, i get to see your 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 sexy face if i can uh, you know get get out of here right right <laughs> and he's just like no like never to a peasant uh. right no a peasant <laughs> isn't worthy of seeing my beautiful face yeah <laughs> which uh, is is pretty great uh she leads him to the hole the hole yeah, well, uh, <laughs> and uh tricks him into falling in by uh just leaping over it and he tries to follow her and just falls shot's kind of goofy but i like I, it i will say like <laughs> with that mask on you've got like significant tunnel vision because you're looking through like the pupils of the oni face oh yeah sure that. so like you couldn't see down oh no it's be- it's believable i'm saying the shot itself is kind of goofy it's, but i don't, it's really I don't clear, i think it breaks it. the 180 so like it's a little like confusing um uh but also the, and also, the confusing like, like awkwardness of it, I think, adds to the realism. And also, just like every time we see somebody falling down the hole, it's very obviously like a completely stiff mannequin. <laughs> so there's no like articulation when it's falling. So you know, like it's aged a little bit poorly. So have some of the skeletons down at the bottom of the hole. I like yeah. them though. I do too. Okay. I like. I don't. I, I don't fault the movie for that. I I feel like this movie probably. Uh, did not have a very large budget. Nah. I don't think it needed it. Nah, it's like part of like the magical realism of it. Like the skeletons have been made to look weird and spooky, like well, at the bottom of the hole. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would say they look spooky. Shh, they, just let me have my let me have my. Well, I, I, I like the idea. <laughs> They're the, like spirit Halloween. The, uh, the, the whole <laughs> like just consumes all of the bodies except for yeah. the skeletons themselves. In that respect, it is a little bit of magical realism. You know? Sure. Um, but well, also we see like the crows and or ravens um, over yes. the top of the hole. Yes. They've been picking them clean. Yeah. Now there is there is a realism element to to why they're literally picked clean. Yeah. Well, the uh, the mother descends to the bottom of the hole because she's got to get you know homeboy's gear. But she also... too is a raven. Right. Yeah. She's a scavenger. Hey, look metaphors. But <laughs> also you know? she does really want to see his hot face. Oh yeah, she's um, got that need. She's got that tree she, rubbing against need. Yeah. Which she also does earlier on. She humps either. a tree yeah. shortly before this. We've all been there. Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, you yeah. can relate. Sometimes you gotta do. You, what you gotta do. Sometimes you just get so horny that you have to run around a field rolling on the ground, <laughs> screaming and grabbing your crotch and, you know, humping a dead tree. You know, you just get, nature calls. Yeah, grass <laughs> fever. You know, sometimes you're just that horny and there's nothing wrong with that. Is that the subtitle for this movie, Ben? <laughs> Yes. Onibaba colon nature calls. <laughs> More like nature comes, am I right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so so when she gets to the bottom of the hole and she's like taking off all his armor, she's like, well, we'll see how pretty that face is now. And she like has a really hard time getting the mask off. Like it seems to be stuck. And when she finally does get it off, his face is uh, is disfigured and kind of like rotten looking. Yeah, and like like leprous. It's yeah. like, oh, uh, so so much for this beautiful face. Oh, which actually kind of gives like a realism point. It's kind of like leprosy. Well, I mean, yeah, or, you know, it's the, the effects of the mask. That's the implication. Because we, cause we, see, that, we see that again later. Because she does, she does take the mask and devises a, a plan to uh, drive her daughter-in-law away from Hachi by creating a, a demon character that she portrays out in the grass. Every night when the daughter tries to go to Hachi's hut, she appears... As this uh, this horrible uh, old demon woman, this Oni Baba, you could say. She didn't choose to put on the mask. The mask chose her. <laughs> well, yeah, she she introduces that earlier in the movie when she tells the daughter of how it's a sin to right. run off and have affairs like this. Yeah, she that saw, premarital uh, sex is no she good. She saw a, a great priest in, in Kyoto years before, and he gave a sermon about how horrible hell is and how demons will will come for sinners. I like I like how one of the themes of this movie is if you meet Buddha on the road, kill him. Yeah, <laughs> Literally. right. Literally, <laughs> like the guy kills a priest on the road. The mother like suffers the consequences of trying to like instill like Buddhist messages for well, selfish reasons. Right. None of like, them. It, none of them actually believe in any of this. They're yeah. all nihilists, basically. Like Hachi, you know, even says like there's there is no, there's no such thing as Buddha. There's no such thing as demons. And like despite 
the mother's story you know it, she's making it up she's trying to to like scare the daughter i love how she describes it hell too it's like pretty vivid i forget all of it but uh one of my favorite parts is she describes like a lake of fire which is pretty standard then a mountain of needles yeah it's right like, like i've read the divine comedy i don't remember needle mountain but damn would it fit like what a what a horrifying like premise like yeah uh, and and people the, with dog legs like, yeah the she, spirits uh, of of the damned uh growing four legs from their faces and shit like that it's like it's very evocative i can just imagine the the junji ito adaptation of uh, onibaba uh maybe that's the only okay way all like right now there we go well, finally okay, <laughs> if, we did if find it's one. an anime and it's done by junji ito there we go there we go okay yeah now, there we go awesome. now we're on to something we do we do have an option there is yeah there is room i love the the mask and the the uh how she turns herself into the demon those are some of my favorite shots in the movie of oh her, absolutely like, uh kind of like gliding above the grass kind of all all lit from below and very uh very spooky and ethereal almost always like devoid of audio or like music or anything like that it's always silent which is you know where you'd expect it to not be silent is when you see the demon but the, the choice to be restrained there i think works very nicely yeah. yeah and that that's really the only supernatural thing that we see in the film is the way that like the demon like glides over the grass um and we know like as a viewer that it's the mother-in-law like we right. know it's just her well you um, can and you get a sense that like it's it's like from the daughter's perspective yes yeah. well and one of the big things is the mother has you know a big streak of gray hair and yeah. you see it even with the mask on the, the shots with her with the mask on in the grass are so evocative. Yeah. Like, the way they're lit is just so iconic. It's a fantastic design. Definitely a, uh, a, a fantastic example of, like, a traditional Japanese demon mask. Uh, looks fantastic. It has kind of a uh, an almost, like piteous expression in kind in a kind of way that i think uh really helps the the scene at the very end when surprise surprise she cannot remove the mask and she exposes her ruse and her desperation you know to help have the daughter help her take this mask off and you know just like the the expression on the face of the mask it goes from being horrifying to kind of pathetic great example of the kuleshov effect you know throw around that fun film school term where the context of what's happening determines how you feel about somebody's facial expressions it parallels how the daughter responds to the mask after you know she sees the onibaba in the grass she runs back to the hut and curls up in the corner yeah and uh is just weeping to have the roles reversed where the daughter comes into the hut and the mother is just in the corner weeping with the mask stuck on her face is yeah it's so evocative and uh that scene is incredible. It's my favorite scene in the movie is at the very end when they're trying to remove the mask. Especially the, because the daughter's like bartering with the mother like for uh, the, the opportunity to still go and see Hachi, even right. though like we as an audience know Hachi dead. Yeah, <laughs> I, that was great, too, like that Hachi doesn't have some kind of like illustrious or like fitting end. he's literally just a, a, a victim of a random act of violence, just like we've seen throughout the entire course of the movie, you know, just a victim of circumstance. Yeah. Well, That's and really also bleak. like generally by an act, they themselves have committed at some point in the film. Right. You know, I was thinking, in terms of modernizations and remakes, I think they already made one. Uh-oh. The Goosebumps book, The Haunted Mask. Oh, my oh. God. <laughs> See, I was going to say Jim Carrey is the mask. Oh. <laughs> Somebody stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Just imagine the mother saying that now. <laughs> Back to the, uh, the the scene where they're trying to get the mask off. At a certain point, the daughter just, like, picks up a mallet and starts trying to, like, break the mask, like, off of her face. She's just, like, clubbing the mother, like, in the face as she's, like, rolling around on the floor, like, screaming and wailing. Well, it's cool, too, because, like, we see the mallet get used regularly in the film. Yeah. Because they're using it to, to like, mill the uh, flower or however that works. Like, so they're like, we, we see them regularly using this mallet. So it is yeah. kind of like a Chekhov situation. 
situation. And, uh, and the, the mother uses it to hammer in a post by the hole that she ties the rope to yeah, so she can yeah. climb down into it. Yeah, so, yeah, Chekhov's mallet is uh, is satisfied in this in this film. <laughs> that That's probably, like, the only instance of legitimate le- regret in the film is when she realizes, oh, shit, I fucked up and I'm being punished for it now by something that I did not believe existed. Uh, and for the daughter to just, like, coldly just like smashing her in the face with a hammer to try to break it and she does eventually i mean they've they've all been reduced to sociopathy at that point what i love about it too is you can tell the original story was very supernatural and you know very much a parable but the way it's portrayed in this movie it strips it of a lot of the supernatural elements yeah pretty much everything can be like justified yeah like she even justifies the mask being stuck by it being in the rain, you know, mm-hmm. and it attaching to her face. Well, we could say leprosy or whatever else. She tries to face, justify yeah. it in that way. I think. I think that, at least for me, the way I read it is that the that the mask is is stuck for. Uh, uh, supernatural reasons. Oh, it, it but definitely I think, is. But that's but like can be there's explained an ambiguity. Away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's because yeah. when we see the the samurai, there are several shots where he's low lit and the camera is angled up towards him, and the mask and his chin just meet. Yeah, like it. The, it looks you can like even his see face it with the, the, the mother. I, I mean, I like it as a, as a supernatural device because it does not have some kind of like design. You know, it's it just kind of is. Which mm-hmm. I think is it, and it doesn't. It doesn't need an explanation. They give it one as the mother being punished for her sins, like she was telling the daughter. But like, is that really what it is? Well, the, Who knows? The soldier, too. The the general, like he also like make makes a confession. Even he is so desperate, like he feels the need to confess to this like peasant woman who's just showing him the way. Yeah, you know, and he he makes it clear too that he, you know, I'm I'm just a guy. Like I also ran away from my men. He could also have been being punished yeah. by the mask. It's well. like a, it's like an outward reflection of guilt kind of mm-hmm. uh, which is which is great. And when she does get the mask off, uh, she is similarly uh, disfigured beneath. It's it's almost as I, I think it's supposed to be the impression of like the like the mask ripping off the the skin of the face when you finally yeah. get it off. Face off. <laughs> face off. <laughs> okay, so now I'm thinking about a live action Onibaba remake with Nicolas Cage. Ooh. No, Nicolas Cage as the mother and Jim Carrey as the daughter. Perfect. Oh, yeah. That's no, there it is. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, fucking John Travolta as uh, as Hachi. Hachi. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> there love it is. It. We've got it. <laughs> it's the Hollywood. Where's our Onibaba? <laughs> Where's our money, like, for these free ideas that we're just giving away? I would like to revisit the horniness a little bit. Sure, why Um, not? One of the largest points of tension I felt during this movie was towards the beginning when Hachi first arrives. Because I, I was very worried that the film was going to devolve into a rape scene. Uh, I was extremely uncomfortable during like all those moments where like Hachi was like, like looking up, looking the daughter like up and down. He's Um, pretty rapey. He was. He essentially stalks her. He does. He stalks her and she is equally horny. Right. And I think that's the, the supreme like saving grace of all of it. Once that's those sequences started to begin, I was like very uncomfortable and I was very worried about where it was going. I, mean, I feel like that's I kind was, of by design. Oh, it absolutely is. It's it's uh, it's a, an incredible point of tension because you don't know exactly where they're going to go with that. And it is sort of a sigh of relief when like she goes to him. Yeah. In the night. Um, and like even, even then, like she like throws a boulder through his window, like through his door. Like she's going to kill his him. attention. Yeah, to yeah. get his attention. Like that's that's one way to do it. Well, it's like, like when he sees, booty when call. He sees like, her, like he kind of like grabs her roughly and like grabs a handful of titty and then she slaps him. But yeah. then they go in the house. She and, runs into the house. Yeah. Like, right. Like, and like, then, like intentionally, like leading yeah. him into the house. Like there's kind of like a cell, almost like a self-loathing aspect of it. But the horniness prevails. 
Horniness prevails. Like yeah. it always does. Mm-hmm. Can't fight the horny. Um, and like the shots, the shots are like fairly gratuitous, um, like leading up to that. Like we have a lot of like, we have a couple of sequences where like the, the cameraman is just like straight, like right on like her ass as she's like swaying, you know, like, like swaying as she's walking away. Like we get full on Hachi vision. And I was very worried about that. But again, like the justification comes from the female characters as well. Like, like showing that same like desperation. And so like everybody's horny in this movie. Everybody's desperate. Yeah. And that the yeah, hole must valid, be filled. That's really one thing to mention too, you know, like this movie came out in the sixties. Like it, this was really gratuitous for the time. Like, yeah. I, that's an showed, excellent point. It's gratuitous for now. Yeah. yeah. Um, Right, so just imagine the 60s, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it being a foreign film helps a little bit, you know, but still, even so, yeah, it would have been a lot for the the 60s. I mean, even, like, now in Japan, you have to blur, like, pretty much any nudity, right? Like That's true. But that's a rel. as far as I know, that's, that's a relatively, relatively new. Recent, I, yeah. yeah. Japan, especially I think the they, Jap- Japanese cinema has like a history of very erotic stuff with like Nagisi o- Oshima, um, stuff like uh, in the realm of the senses and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah, um, where it's very very explicit. Um, uh, yeah, I think the Japanese censorship stuff. I could be wrong, but I'm I think that that's something that happened in like the late '90s, early 2000s, like within the last couple of decades. Yeah. That's a, a kind of a rise of uh, a, a new wave of like conservatism, sort of. Anyway, that's besides the point. Like this is we're this talking is outside a, of our <laughs> knowledge. A little this bit is a that, but... this is a a gratuitous movie in ways that a lot of the movies we watch are not. You know, like it's not particularly violent or gory. Like there's some there's there's definitely some violence. There's not very much blood, but like man, there's a lot of there's a lot of like bestial horniness. This is one of those films. In some respects, kind of like The Lighthouse or The Shining, where the environment is the, the, the horror. Is the monster. Aspect, yeah. But, you know, having that tall grass where it's it's almost labyrinthine, you can disorient yourself very easily. You can't really see what's in front of you, and you're surrounded by it, and you're surrounded by the danger of war on top of it. And you're surrounded by desperation and desperate people. Yeah. You know, it is a horrifying environment. And the fact, too, that, like, there is... Well, well, for the sake of the war, for, like, the big picture stuff, there is no right answer. Like, on a small scale, for just them, there is one. Clearly, these two, like, have it for each other. Her husband's dead. Hachi also, like... Uh, I'm not going to uh, defend Hachi very much at all uh, for obvious reasons, but like he does like make offers to marry first. Like he does request like, hey, like, can I can can we shack up? Right. Like we're, like we're husband, horny out here. Like, like your come husband's on. dead. Let's be horny together. Yeah. She's young. Like, you know, like I'm here. And, and you know, like there there was a right answer in that if they had said yes and they'd gotten together and she'd just still been like right down the road. Or whatever else or just like with them you know like they they could have all like thrived together right well yeah that's the thing if they had if they had found community with one another and like we see, they could have done much better for themselves we even see a circumstance where they are like it's for like horrible means but they do like work together to to take down the samurai that crossed the water yeah and like so we, we do mm-hmm. get a moment where all three of them are like essentially accidentally helping each other but they do and, and they profit from it. They, they all eat, do. They yeah. eat well after that. And they share. Like none yeah. of them keeps for themselves. Like uh, when ha- Hachi like trades the uh, one of the sacks for sake, you think he's being selfish then, but the mother-in-law is the one who drinks most of most of it. Yeah. In the film. Uh, well, and so it, like even Hachi there was like not even like trying to be and, selfish. He was sharing. And it seems like his rapport with the the blacksmith giving the stuff, you know, is better to the point where he just grabs additional stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, because like uh, of know. his charm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's able to like walk out of there with more stuff than the rest of them. 
they just work together, man. Teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. But... I mean, you know, Hachi could have had like a like a stepmom situation going on yeah. too, and everything because she approaches him, he turns her down. Totally. Well, and it's like, you know? and and part of that is is the mother in law's own selfishness as well because yes. she assumes that if the daughter, you know, goes with Hachi, then that she's going to be abandoned. Rather, and it's like, you know, that yeah, like you said, they live right next to each other in the field. You know, they're neighbors. Just because the you know the daughter has a new husband does not mean that they won't still be able to coexist. But it's like there's there's too much of that like conniving for that to be realistic. Because once again, everybody's selfish as shit and horny. The very end of the film is suitably poetic. The freshly demasked mother is chasing the daughter through the field. We see them coming upon the hole. The daughter jumps over the hole and we see the mother jump and then it cuts to black before we see whether she clears all while she's screaming i'm a human being uh and i think that like that moment is so representative of like overcoming your baser instincts and like are you really a human like can you make the leap over the whole this like yawning hunger that consumes everything like can you overcome that and prove that you are still human and the daughter does by clearing that jump, but we don't know if the mother-in-law does, and because it cuts, it cuts to black before she lands or doesn't. So it's like, has she, you know, is she still human, or has she, you know, become a demon? Will she be consumed by the whole? And also, the the daughter-in-law being fully convinced that she is a demon is the mother's own fault. Like, yeah. like she she's the one who was she did that. like she yeah she planted those seeds yeah could convince her that demons were real, uh and uh you know so that when she sees her as one well it's her own damn fault so yeah. I appreciated that very poetic justice yeah e it's a it's a really great way for the film to end yeah. strong um, sense of poetic justice yes yeah, absolutely do you guys want to rate this yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, well, Ben, this was your pick, so why All don't you right. start? Well, uh, I think this is one of my favorite examples of stark black and white cinematography. I love the score. I love the atmosphere. You know, this is, like I said, very much an environmental horror movie in that, like, the horror, in many respects, comes from the environment that it lives in. Um, I love the tall grass. I love all of that stuff. I think it's a really fantastic movie. It's one of my favorites. I'm going to give it a five. It's near perfect for me. Ditto. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing <laughs> this one. It's a film I, cl I needed to see. I, I, I didn't know I did uh, until after watching it. And uh, thank you. Bring that fucker home. Yeah, uh, well, now I feel kind of bad because I, I have to be the the one slight no! party pooper. Ah! Um, and and I will I will preface this by saying that my rating is, I mean, just like every rating, but my, my reasons for this are pretty much solely a matter of taste and not necessarily a matter of uh, storytelling or technical ability or anything. I just think that the movie could be about... 15 minutes shorter and I think it would be okay. I like the oh, slow burn and I think that the slow burn really helps build to the climax, but I just think there are like one or two scenes too many of like the daughter and Hachi uh running through the grass screaming hornily. I think you can I think you get the point after after a certain amount of time like I think that there's just a little bit of fat that can be trimmed but otherwise like I think this is a a, a masterwork film in many ways. Extremely well written, very well directed, absolutely beautiful to look at. Uh compelling, interesting, kind of despicable characters. Uh, yeah, I, I, I still like it a lot. I'm going to give it a four out of five. All right. That'll, uh, that'll give Onibaba an average of 4.7 out of five pods. So my rating doesn't tip the scales too much in this case. I think you rated this movie lower than I, or, uh, lower than I rated Guyver. <laughs> Yes, that's true. <laughs> but lower than I don't know who needs and, to reevaluate here. I and, think it's uh, me. But Gretel and Hansel. Uh, yeah, your your ratings are your rating system is all over the place. <laughs> it's true. It's but, true. Uh, I'll, uh, I I stand. I mean, I, I, 
I admit it. I, I, I guess I stand by it, but uh, it's yeah. okay. It's I. I think that it's all over the I, place. I think that it's. Uh, I did. I did give Gretel and Hansel a very high rating. I. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, again, like I was being a, a little fair to the film, like because I. I didn't really see it in the best circumstances, and I, I still want to see it again. I to, think it's. I think it's just gauge. kind of indicative of of your of your passion in in the moment because you this know a lot I, of I get very a excited. lot of times a lot of times we record immediately after watching a film so it's not often that we have time to like let the film sink in for a few days before we talk about it we're usually coming hot off of it and you know films stick with you or don't in ways that you don't expect mm-hmm. so and you've indeed. seen this one before yes i yeah. have seen so this you've one. had you've had time to yeah, process it as well which mm-hmm. is which is valid there have been i think times on the podcast where i've even mentioned during episodes where we have um watched a movie and then waited a week to record or several days to record. Uh, there have been times where I've mentioned yeah. that, you know, like my my reading like mm-hmm. went down over, I had, over having time to process it. But, oh, man, I don't know. Uh, with, with this movie, like some of those yeah. shots. Oh, this, oh, this, shots honestly, so in my opinion, this movie should be required viewing for any serious horror fan. Yeah. I think so. I mean, even despite the fact that I rated a little bit lower, I think that uh, and fantasy is, writers, yeah, too. I think like it's a, uh, it's a really good example of like atmospheric storytelling and and atmospheric horror you know horror without like really a monster i think that uh this movie does that extremely well well uh cleveland why don't you go on over to the sponsor shelf and tell us who's uh who's sponsoring this week's episode of the show all right uh this week is uh brought to you by oni babushka's best Oni bagels. Get your Oni Babushka's best Oni bagels uh, at uh, Oni... uh, You you heard it here. Uh, I guess they have bagels and they're served to you by uh, a lovely old Babushka and something to do with... A demon Babushka? (laughs) Yeah, I guess a demon Babushka. Um, Aren't they the same thing? (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. All right. God, well, that was awful. <laughs> that was awful. I'm sorry, any y'all had to hear that. Oh man. <laughs> but we don't pick our sponsors, so um, no, no. The sponsor shelf picks our sponsors. That's One funny. thing I did want to mention before we, you know, wrap up the show is uh, we have a little bit of news uh, that uh, the hunt. Uh, oh yeah. The movie that we were talking about covering last year, um, but got pulled because. It was like Rich Elites versus Deplorables and too political, really yeah. politically oh, that one. charged. Yeah, um, they pulled it from screening anyway. It anywhere. was supposed to come out on my birthday and last year. They just announced that it's coming out next month. They're really leaning into the controversy as well. Um, I don't know if you guys ended up watching the trailer that came I out. I still haven't for seen it. the new trailer. Um, no. Not the new it one. It seems funny. Like, they lean into the humor more than they did in the past. I mean, I that's the impression I got from the first trailer. Like, we, mm-hmm. I remember, I think we talked about it a little bit on the show, like, the controversy of it getting pulled and how it seemed, like, weird. Like, it didn't seem like the kind of movie that would be... It seemed, uh, like, satire to begin with. Yeah, it, like, it, it seemed like a movie, like, why are people taking this so seriously? I'm curious now i think that they have taken that controversy and tried to spin it to their favor uh as in in their new marketing campaign uh i believe that they're saying uh something to the effect of the most controversial film of the year is the one that nobody's seen so uh (laughs) mm -mm. We'll we'll see, but yeah, that has a a release date for March twenty sixth, I believe. Something like that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we'll probably cover that. Yeah. Did we do predictions for that one no, last year? No, we did not. No, I didn't no. think so. Um. But yeah, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be curious. So Trilla didn't do much for me. No. I'll, I mean, I'll it see. didn't. Yeah. It it, it didn't look extraordinary. No. It, it, from the trailer that I remember seeing, it looked fun. But unremarkable. This so, is like a hunt down movie. Like I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, not that one of the interesting things is I feel like the uh, the controversy almost makes it more fascinating for right. me. Yeah, no. I, I wonder too, like how much they're just writing that out because they don't have anything else to write out. 
we'll revisit the controversy after we see the movie. How about that? Yes, that is a good uh, book. End. No yeah. need to speculate too much. Well, next week, uh, we are jumping back to the year 2020 and we're going to see the lodge. Wait, we're going uh, back to 2020 from 1964 where we were this week. We're oh, back to the oh, future. Of course. Back to the future. Right? Right. Thank you. Yeah. We've, we've, we're in 1964 right now, Cleveland. <laughs> Sorry, doc Brown. It took me a moment. Yeah. Uh, the lodge is coming out finally. Uh, it has, uh, been making the festival circuit for a while now. And I've been hearing whispers of how great it is. Um, for a long time and uh it's finally coming out and we're going to be talking about next week and a special guest yes we will be joined again by uh katie of lambley optic who was uh on our shining episode a much uh smarter and more articulate (laughs) uh film critic than any of us are so it'll be refreshing to have somebody who actually knows sounds like they know what they're talking about back on the show yeah katie's great it'll be great to have her back so on. uh yeah it'll that'll be a, a great episode so uh tune back in next week to catch our review of the lodge Yay. with katie uh until then uh while you wait head on over into that endless sea of podcasts that is apple podcasts and find the gaping hole that is the pod people and dive down deep into there and rummage through the bones until you find five stars and smash all of them and while smash you're, those bone stars and while you're there consider uh scrawling a nice review of the podcast on the wall in your own blood of course as it is necessary to complete the ritual uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at podpeoplepod and on letterbox.com slash podpeoplepod, where you will find a list of all the films we've talked about thus far on the show with our average ratings and links to those corresponding episodes. Uh, follow me on Twitter at uh, Deep State Ozzy if you want. I'm on Twitter at Mr. Sheets. And I'm very rarely tweeting for Light Arc Studio as we continue to work on our game. And I'm very rarely tweeting because I'm mostly working on the game. It stares back. Uh, it's already on Steam in early access. You know the drill. Go check it out. It's rad. Maybe you'll agree. Maybe you won't. Leave a review if you like it. And uh, you can find our uh, a link to join our uh, Light Arc Studio Discord if you so choose. Uh, you can find that link on the LightArc Twitter account or at LightArcStudio.com. Yeah, you can talk to us directly. Pop on in, say you're here for the podcast, and you will be welcome with open, slippery arms. The slipperiest. Thank you, as always, for listening. And uh, until next time, I can feel the horniness building up within <laughs> me. I think I'm. I need to run out into a field before I uh, before I make a mess in here. Yeah, I gotta go find a tree. <laughs> Bye.